2018 budget was announced on the 1st of February. It's time that we possibly took a look at how our economy has shaped up in the course of the last many years. And it is also time to look at what we would want the 2019 government and the 2024 government to do for us. So I'll break my talk into two parts. In part one, I'll try to tell you the story of India's movement from 1991, when it opened up its economy, to today, 2018. 27 long years when an entire new generation was not only born, but has gone to school, has gone to college, and has possibly worked in the corporate sector for at least a minimum of five years. It's a generation that has a completely different set of priorities, a completely different set of work ethics, a totally different understanding of what constitutes property in public life, and a completely different feel of what it wants India to do tomorrow. In the second part, I'll possibly identify five key areas where I think the forthcoming governments, 2019 and 2024 Indian governments should work so that in the space of the next 10 years, we could blossom into a more outstanding economy. Let's trace our journey back to 1991 and try to compare ourselves with another of an Asian giant, China. Everybody today says, and everybody has been saying for quite some years now, that these two economies, China and India, would be the bulwark economies of the 21st century. Many have often said that while China would be the manufacturing hub of the world, India is more likely to be the knowledge capital. But over the last few years, things are changing. Far more important is the fact that back in 1991, when India opened up its economy, it was almost as equal to the size of China. In fact, we were 0.91 times the GDP of China. In the space of the next 15 years, we actually collapsed. We fell down to about 37% of the Chinese economy, which means 0.37. We were just 0.37 times China, notwithstanding the fact that our GDP has grown at a very, very fast clip by historical standards. And today we are just 0.2, that means one-fifth the size of China. This is just from the fact that while India might have grown, India's most principal competitor in the next 30 years, China, has grown at a much, much faster clip. If you take another one of a very significant uh, indicator, which is the gross domestic product per capita, you will realize that back in 1991, both India and China stood almost head to head. Today, GDP per capita which measures the income earned per individual in the country. India stands at $1861 per annum. China is almost five times that at close to $8806, which means that not only has Chinese economy grown very, very fast, China per capita income has also grown significantly fast. I'll just share another piece of statistic. We talk about the well-being of a nation. The well-being of a nation is largely measured by its Human Development Index, an index that was developed, among others, by India's Nobel Prize-winning economist, Dr. Amartya Sen. The index talks about, or is based on three important parameters. A, the quality of life. B, the extent of knowledge capital that gets built, and three, of course, the income that the citizen of a country earns. On the basis of these three parameters, India stands 131 out of 188 countries in the world, which is not exactly the kind of growth that we were looking at. However, if you look at the numbers per se, from 0.428, which is where we were in 1970, 1991, we are sitting at 0.624 today, which means approximately a 50% improvement. 
any country which is at 1.000 in the HDI is possibly the best country to live in in the context of education, in the context of earnings and in the context of healthcare. I now move to the second part where I try to talk to you about what I think is India's unfinished agenda. I have been talking about this for quite a few years now and I thought I will place before you what I think are the five important things that should be the focus point in the course of the next 10 years. First important and major development that is that I see is likely to take place is reforms in the area of education. We are going to increasingly see more socially conscious and I use the word socially conscious very carefully, socially conscious private players get into India's primary education because in the new world order what's important is how knowledgeable one is, how skilled one is. We talk about India's enormous advantage of having a demographic dividend but that demographic dividend can actually become a demographic time bomb if our people are not well skilled and that skilling has to happen in stage one which is in primary education. A second important development that is absolutely critical in the years ahead as uh, India's population grows is reforms in the area of healthcare. I think the first important step has been taken by this government in this budget in the announcement of universal healthcare. Personally, I believe that every citizen in a country has the right to life has the right to liberty, has the right to education, possibly a right to employment and more importantly a right to well-being or healthcare. While the details of the governmental policies are not as it announced and while one would like that the hospital infrastructure of government players undergo significant transformation, I think the first step in the direction of Universal healthcare, idea borrowed from what internationally is known as Obamacare, has taken place. But I think there is still a very, very long way to go. As somebody once said, the challenge today is not that one might die too young. The challenge today is that one might live a shade too long. Reform number three that is required, that should be worked out in the course of the next 10 years, should be worked out by both the executive and the judiciary, would be in the area of judicial reforms. Today we have 3.2 crore court cases pending. Today the time that it takes for a case to be closed out is so very long that people are more keen to do out of the court settlement. Today for example the judiciary works for a fraction of the year. It has long spells of holidays. It works a single ship. It writes judgments that runs into reams and reams and reams of pages in language that is very, very difficult for a common man to understand. I think judicial reforms is an idea whose time has come because one of the most important reasons why India continues to be a working democracy, why India continues to be a good democracy, is that the judiciary has in the past done an outstanding job. Point number four that is likely to happen is reforms in the area of housing. The government talks about housing for all as in universal housing. I do not know how things will pan out in the next 10 years. The new generation of today is a generation that is likely to want to be asset light as in own less, hire more. That's a possibility that is there. Own less of assets, rent or hire more of them. That's a distinct possibility. But I think that in a country like ours where uh, a roof to live under is an emotional attachment, there's an urgent need for the government and for private players because this can only happen with a public-private partnership as, as, as had happened to India's roads by which things can be carried forward. 
Last but definitely not the least, I think the most important thing is to bring about reforms in our infrastructure, high quality roads, high quality airport, high quality rail transport system, high quality ports. These I think are the urgent requirements of this country. So while I summarize what I said, I said in the course of the last 25 years, India has grown at a fast clip. But the clip at which India has grown does not match too very well to the country that is built to be India's competitor, China. I said that there are five important things that the governments in the course of the next 10 years must look at. They are in the area of education, they are in the area of healthcare, they are in the area of judiciary, housing, and last but not the least, infrastructure. Thank you.